News exclusive. We go in depth on all the big issues with House Speaker Paul Ryan. He joins us from Janesville, Wisconsin. Mr. Speaker, thanks for being here. Hey, good to be with you, Brett. Nice want, to be with you. I want to start with, we want to talk about health care, which is why you're out there in Wisconsin and spend some time on that. But I want mm -hmm. to start with the, the news of the day, the continued fallout uh, from Attorney General Sessions' recusal yesterday and this Russia investigation. I know what you, you've said about it. Yesterday at a press conference, you said this when asked about recusing. If he himself is the subject of an investigation, of course he would. Uh, but if he's not, I don't see any purpose or reason to doing this. Okay, so a couple hours after that, he did it. What do you think happened? Well, I think what he did was he listened to advice of uh, people within the Justice Department on how best to maintain the integrity and the independence of the Justice Department. And so I think he, he I don't think he had to do this, but I think he did what he thought was in the best interest of the Justice Department, which I think is fine. Uh, he was a surrogate for the campaign. And so I think he just wanted to err on the side of caution and remove any shred of doubt or concern whatsoever by doing that. So I think he kind of went above and beyond, and I think he should be um, touted for doing that. And I've heard you talk about the investigation so far that you have not seen any evidence of collusion or cooperation or communication beyond what we know now. How many members of Congress do you think have interacted with the Russian ambassador or with their other diplomats over the last several years? Oh, gosh. Uh, I would think dozens, if not more, the hundreds. Uh, that's very common. Uh, we meet with ambassadors constantly as members of Congress. Um, that's their job is to come and meet with members of Congress and express their interests, their concerns, especially with people on foreign policy committees like Armed Services Committee or the Foreign Relations Committee. Um, I host an annual um, reception for the entire diplomatic corps as Speaker of the House every year, and you have dozens of ambassadors coming to the Capitol for just a, a welcome reception. So it's a very, very, very common thing for members of Congress to interact um, with ambassadors of other countries. Understanding that these investigations are going forward, and you're going to let them play out. At some point, are you going to speak up if there's not there there uh, and say we need to move on from this? No, I think that's right, but, but they did meddle with our election. That's something we know. And by the way, we know this because of investigations that we in Congress or our intelligence committees and the intelligence community themselves discovered. So th that's why we think we want to get to the bottom of what Russia is up to. Uh, that's a problem. And Russia not only meddles, try to meddle with our election, but they're doing this all around the world. They do this in Europe, uh, obviously Ukraine. So I think there's an interest to make sure that we can find out exactly what is Russia up to and all that they've been doing. But yes, you're right. If, if this is just more of a fishing expedition, we're not interested in continuing to do a fishing expedition. But having said that, you know, Congress is always doing oversight. This is our job. And the committee in the House, like the committee in the Senate, has uh, a scope that they've agreed to between Republicans and Democrats on how to go forward with this investigation to make sure that no stone is unturned, to make sure that we get to the bottom of things. And as of yet, we've never been presented with any evidence whatsoever that anybody in, in the Trump campaign or an American official um, was involved with the Russians on any of this. Are you concerned? Concerned on the flip side that the Obama administration may have been surveilling members of the Trump campaign uh, in a pretty detailed investigation uh, during the election. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's the case. If you recall, uh, President Obama asked the intelligence community after the election to canvas all the intelligence and give a report to Congress on what Russia did do and, and all their interactions. And in that report, they nobody alleged that there was a person in America, like a Trump campaign official, involved with the Russians on this. So if they would have found that, you think they would have put that in the report that they gave us in early January. Right, but there's a report the that uh, June 2016, there's a FISA request by the Obama administration, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance oh. Court, to monitor communications involving Donald Trump and several other uh, campaign officials. Then they, re, they get turned down and then in October they renew it and they do uh, start a wiretap uh, at Trump Tower with some computer and Russian banks and it doesn't show up anything by reporting. Have you heard that? Well, again, and, and like I said, none of us in Congress uh, or anybody that I know in Congress has been presented with evidence uh, to the contrary of what you just said. So you believe it to be true? Yeah, that, that we have seen no evidence that anybody in this campaign 
um, or any other American was in on it with the Russians to meddle in our elections. We know they meddled. Uh, Russia is an adversary, uh, and that's something we had to work to counteract. I got it. But uh, my point is, is that the Obama administration was was pretty aggressive. I have a couple of FISA reports. No, I hear your point. But I, I'm saying, but but I've I've seen nothing of that. I've seen nothing come of that. That's my point. Okay, let's turn to Obamacare. Uh, you're out there in Janesville, making this pitch, kind of doing the messaging. When is the rollout? Will you roll it out next week? Yeah, well, we're, I'll let the committees of jurisdiction um, um, make the announcement on that. Uh, but our committees that write these bills, uh, working very, very closely with the administration, are fine-tuning the legislation. That's what you do when you're near the end of a drafting of, of a big piece of legislation like this. They're going through the fine-tuning of the legislation. So the, the Commerce Committee and the Ways and Means Committee are the two key committees in the House. They're running points on this in the House. They're working with their counterparts in the Senate and in the White House. Um, when they're done with their fine-tuning, they'll make that they'll make that announcement. And then they'll tell us uh, when they're ready to go and, and move on the legislation. Well, so they'll make that announcement pretty soon, I what think. What do you say to the critics who say, you're just doing what Democrats used to do, and that's cramming legislation down the throats uh, in kind of the dark of night, not a, in a transparent way. Are you kidding me, Brett? Give me I'm, a break. I'm just telling Seriously. you what they say. We no, no, I know. Okay, let's just review what we've been doing. Last year, in early 2016, we rolled out an Obamacare repeal and replace plan. We called it a better way. Go on the internet and read it. We ran on that plan. That plan resembled Tom Price's legislation that so many people um, in Congress were, were co-sponsors of. Then after um, the election uh, came and we won the election, we started putting that plan into legislative text, having hearings. All these hearings on repealing and replacing Ob Obamacare were in the congressional committee. So we've been doing hearings all year long. Now we're translating the findings of those hearings, that plan into legislative legislative text, that's the fine-tuning of the drafting that's occurring, and then guess what? This bill's not being written in my office like it was in Harry Reid's office on Christmas Eve in 2009. This bill is written, being written by the committees that are in charge of health care, which is the regular order process. This bill will go through the committee process, go through the budget committee, then go to the floor of Congress under what we call regular order order. Right. That is precisely the most transparent and, and, and normal way of doing business, which is the opposite of what the Democrats did when they crammed Obamacare through. All right. Well, here is not a liberal Democrat, a Republican senator who says he's trying to get the details. Wait, let me bill. guess. You're going to quote Rand Paul for a Rand second Paul, here. Yeah, hold right. on. <laughs> yeah. What we think is being hidden from conservatives is that there's a lot of Obamacare life there's a new entitlement program that will increase at about 5% a year forever. There is also a Cadillac tax or something similar to the Cadillac tax that was in Obamacare. And there's also an individual mandate, believe it or not. Instead of paying the mandate to the government, they're going to tell you you have to pay the mandate by law to an insurance company. So a lot of conservatives will be upset to know that we're keeping those things from Obamacare and there needs to be an open debate about it. Is that all true? No, it's not. And um, I think he's just kind of, you know, I like Rand, but I think he's looking for a publicity stunt here. Uh, what's happening is the committees of jurisdiction are drafting legislation and getting feedback from their members. Uh, that's exactly how legislation is supposed to be written. Um, the things he described are, are, are just not accurate. And uh, like I said, when the committees write their bills and put their bills out there to mark up, everybody will see what, what they've done. Right. But are you worried that if on the tax side or the fight on the Medicaid yeah. side that you only have 21 votes to lose and you only have one shot at I'm this not worried. with reconciliation? You I'm, only have one shot at, at the apple. I'm, yeah. I'm not really worried at all because we're, we're doing this hand in glove with President Trump, with, the, with Tom Price, HHS secretary, with our counterparts in the Senate. We're all working off the same piece of paper, the same legislation. So let me just describe in general what we're talking about here. We're talking about giving the states control of the Medicaid um, program, which is something that conservatives have been fighting for for years. I wrote our budgets. We used to call them the Roadmap for America, then the Path of Prosperity. Every one of my, road, uh, of my budgets that I wrote as the conservative gold standard for Republicans was to give states control of Medicaid. And then on the tax front, we've long been saying we need to equalize the tax re treatment of health care for everybody in America. Right now, the tax code discriminates against people who do not get health care from their jobs. There's a huge tax benefit if you get, get uh, health care at work. 
if you've got to go buy your health insurance, there's no tax benefit for you. So what conservatives have long said is let's equalize the tax treatment for health care so that if you it doesn't matter whether you get it health care at work or not at work, let's give you the same kind of tax benefit so that you can go buy what you want to buy. You go into a free market as a consumer and buy the plan of your choosing with with the health savings accounts as well. This is what we have long stood on as conservatives. It is the plan that we ran on in all of 2016 that we said if we get the chance of having a Republican president, a Republican House, and a Republican Senate, we're going to repeal and replace Obamacare, and this is what we're going to replace it with. Well, guess what? We are keeping that promise, and that is exactly what we're doing here. But you're also saying it's going to be a fight over the next few weeks. It's going to be a fight. It's going to be a fight with people who want Obamacare. There's, we got a choice to make. Do we want to keep Obamacare or do we want to repeal and replace Obamacare? The president has been extremely clear that we're going to repeal and replace it with a better system that gives people choice and competition. That's and not, not run so by government. Obamacare where people get freedom. I think he's just, that's a publicity stunt as far as I'm concerned. All right. More with Speaker Ryan on a couple of other issues coming up after a short break. Paul Ryan joining us from his hometown, Janesville, Wisconsin. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what about tax reform? Is that, we know Obamacare is going to roll out likely next week and in coming days. Uh, what about tax reform? When does that all kind of come to fruition? Yeah, well, as we've long been planning, tax reform is part of our spring budget. As you know, Brett, you can do one reconciliation bill at a time. What that means to your viewers who aren't into sort of congressional verbiage here is uh, in a budget bill, that can't be filibustered. And so there are two major projects we're trying to achieve this year, just in the first 200 days of this Trump administration, that we think is enormous progress for the American people. Number one, repeal and replace Obamacare. We know Democrats aren't going to do that. So we have to use a budget bill, which is called reconciliation, to pass that so that that can't be filibustered. And then number two, after this first Obamacare bill that repeals and replaces Obamacare is passed, then we move to another budget. That's our spring budget. And in that budget, we will do tax reform because, again, I don't think Democrats are going to want to work with Republicans to lower taxes, to cut taxes for families, for small businesses, for all kinds of businesses, to expand economic growth. Uh, they believe in more Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren economics, and I don't think they're going to want to work with us on, on reducing tax rates uh, for the American people, for the American workers. And so that's going to take a budget as well. But you can't, you have to do one budget first and then a second budget. You can't do two budgets simultaneously according to our budget rules. As a part of tax reform, you support a border uh, adjustment tax. Wouldn't the largest employees yes. take a hit here? Wouldn't that cost them jobs and possibly pass on that money to the consumer, which kind of takes away some of the money that you're giving uh, tax breaks to? Yeah, actually, we just don't see it that way. Uh, most economists will tell you that the currency adjusts when border adjustments occur. Um, here's the point. This isn't a new idea. This is actually the, the, the idea that 160 countries have. 160 countries already border adjust their taxes. America does not with countries like North Korea, Iran, Afghanistan, Somalia, Sudan. Basically, all other countries and normalized normal industrialized countries border adjust their taxes 160 of them and here's what they do they don't tax their exports and they tax their imports we do the opposite so here's what we do if we make something in america we tax it if it goes overseas we tax it and then it's taxed as it goes into another country when other countries make something they take the tax off of it and as it enters our country because we don't border adjust we don't tax it and so what happens is we have a tax on american made goods and services so all we're saying is let's just level the playing field let's just be equal let's make sure that that foreign imports are taxed at the same level the same way american made products you, are because you today know they're the not from these these places like walmart and other businesses and they say mm -hmm. this is this is not a good thing for the country also you hear the arguments i think from republicans not only in your own caucus but Senate Republicans, then this is going to be a real battle. Is it necessary to yeah. be able to make the numbers add up without blowing up the deficit or the debt? It it is. So as per your earlier point, we, we're going to do this with Republican votes to avoid filibusters. That way we have to do it through a budget and the rules of a budget. The rules of what we call reconciliation is it has to be revenue neutral. So a, a trillion dollars basically gets us a 10 point drop in our tax rates on, on American businesses to make American businesses more competitive We have the highest tax rates in the industrialized world. Corporate tax rates are 35 percent. The top tax rate on successful small businesses is 44.6 percent. The average tax rate on businesses in the industrialized world, 
23%. So we're really losing here. We're really losing jobs and economic growth. American companies are going overseas. We've got to stop that. And this does raise a trillion dollars from overseas, not from American businesses, to lower our tax rates. That's really important. If we don't do this, then we have to get that kind of revenue from within the American economic system, from within our corporate tax base. So the, the trade-off is really also kind of ugly. To the Walmart point, and I understand there's a lot of concern about this, um, we want to make sure that this is done in such a way with the kinds of transition rules so that we ease into a new kind of a system, so we stop taxing American exports, and we have a, a currency adjustment that's gradual so that no consumer sees any change in their prices. This bill, according to the Tax Foundation, 1.7 million new jobs higher wages, almost 10% additional economic growth. This is about jobs, it's about American competitiveness, it's about not hollowing out American manufacturing and getting people to bring their companies back to America, bring manufacturing back to America, and that's healthy for our economy. That's why we're talking about these things. Mr. Speaker, two quick things. One is, in order not to blow up the deficit and debt, you're going to have to do something else, right? I mean, you're going to have to talk about long-term right, entitlement right. reform, even though the President doesn't talk mm -hmm. about it like like that now. Is that fair to say? It is fair to say, but I wouldn't say he's not talking about it. You got, you got to remember, Obamacare well, not it's, it's an entitlement, entitlement as well. No, but no, no. Obamacare repealing and replacing is understand. entitlement reform. But you, you know Lock what we're saying here. Getting Medicaid back to the states and repealing Obamacare is an enormous step in the right direction toward a re in reforming entitlements. There are other entitlements that have to be dealt with. No two ways about it. And that's a conversation we're just going to have to keep on having. And the last thing, why is it that Nancy Pelosi and then Harry Reid were able to keep Democrats much more in line on voting on big things than Republicans? It seems like as we're adding up heads and talking to people up on the Hill, there's a lot of disparity, a lot of pushback about uh, from the Republican caucus. I always the way I look at that, Brett, is Republicans are just much more individualistic. <laughs> you know, we're just we're more indiv we're individualists generally speaking. But at the end of the day, uh, President Trump made it really clear at this great, fantastic speech he gave on Tuesday, which is, we've got big things to do. We've got to do it. We're going to unify to do this. Either you want to repeal and replace Obamacare, or you don't. I think Republicans are going to say yes to that in Congress. Either you want to reform this awful tax code or you don't. I think Republicans are going to say yes to that. I think we either want to rebuild our military or you don't. I think Republicans are going to say yes to that. So I think we're going to have um, negotiations, obviously, out front in public on TV about how we want to achieve these shared conservative goals. But at the end of the day, when we make decisions that this is the consensus among Republicans, this is what the, the direction the president wants to head, we're going to unify and get things done. And that's what I'm confident about. Mr. Speaker, we appreciate your time today. You bet. Take care, Brett.